Welcome back one more time. Before we launch into our material, um, it occurred to me this week as I was working through this that, that many of you may or may not know the, the whole process that I go through. That in, this is really sermon preparation even though you, you know me as a teacher. Uh, I, I realize that while I'm preparing this for this venue and this camera and those of you who will be watching online, that my preparation is no different whatever than were I preaching to a crowd of a hundred or even a thousand. That back during the days of, of serving at, at North Rundle Church or in any of the other churches, I put in so much time during the course of the week. I had a schedule, I had a routine from, from inception to completion, and that has not changed. And whether that matters to you or not, I just wanted you to be aware that you're not getting soul short uh, because of the venue that we're involved in. So having said that, are there certain historical events that um, those are the moments in time when you first become aware of, of something significant or substantial and it will always be a marker in your mind? Well, such was the case this week in my preparation. I thought of these two uh, men that appeared on the landscape in 2013, uh, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Those of you who have been paying attention to the news in the last decade or so, you will remember these, uh, these two names and, and this particular incident. There was a confrontation that took place between these two, and George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin. And when he appeared in court, you, you recall what his defense was? It became known as what? Stand your ground. And it, re it represented a law that was on the books that I, for one, was not even aware of. And so I went back out of curiosity and, and uh, to do my research on stand your ground laws, realizing that it really dates to the, to the early 1600s in England, and it was not called stand your ground, it was called retreat. <laughs> the law said if you're in con confronted by an adversary, uh, then retreat behind a wall and wait for the authorities to show up and take care of the problem. Well, that's nice in theory, but in fact, uh, it's not very practical. So over the course of the last, what, 500 years, uh, 400 years, that, um, that has changed to become what we now know uh, as, as a castle doctrine. Many of the states in our country have this. The state of South Carolina has such, uh, too. It simply means if somebody enters your residence and, and as a trespasser, and you perceive them as a threat, you have the right under law to defend you and yours and your property, even to the use of deadly force. And that stand your law is now being extended not just inside the walls of your house, but not just to the property lines, but anywhere you go um, in public. And it's a part of the Second Amendment argument in terms of the rights of citizens to, to, to bear arms to protect themselves. Uh, I, you know, I got to thinking about this in terms of the context of our study in, in Acts chapter 16. We're now in week 38. Remarkable, uh, though that seems. And as I read forward of the passage that many of you didn't like, not like the fact that we stopped on our text last week where we did because the story that follows is one of your favorite one out of the book of Acts. We simply, you, you see, we can't squeeze it all in and we're taking it as we simply need to go. There's no arbitrary timeline. We're simply taking the sections of Scripture as they're laid out. And as I read about these, um, these events in this portion of Acts chapter 16, this is actually what came to my mind. There is a challenge of living out biblical principles in a cultural context and the concepts that range between pacificity and constitutional rights. We know that there have existed uh, in all times those who believed in the doctrine of being pacifist, that you simply offered no resistance, uh, you're anti-war, you're anti-use uh, of force, you just simply trust providence and, 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 and the Lord to take care of your needs. You don't have to defend yourself, He will defend you. And on the other side, there are those who say that, that government is a, a product of one of the covenant relationships that God gave to man when Noah came off of the ark. It was one of those early covenants uh, of, of governance. 
And so God simply blessed that, and so as it comes into place, that's a part of his divine plan. And under those governance, wherever you are, whatever the laws are, they're designed to protect all citizens, not just a select few. And so one of the challenges that you and I have that I found um, being presented in this particular passage was this very one here. A at what point uh, and under what circumstances is it proper conduct or proper spiritual action for a, a, a follower of Jesus to, to exercise or to assert their rights under a given law in any given set of circumstances. And, and what, where is the ground that we stand on? And where and when do we draw the line? And it's because of that that we've simply entitled today's lesson or today's message as Standing Your Ground. Where and when should a believer stand their ground? Under what circumstances? Under what principles? So follow along uh, if you have your electronic device or your Bible. However you're using this in private Bible study time or this is your substitute for worship. Um, that's on you, but we hope that you're able to follow along. Because I do believe in this principle of, of, of standing your ground. You and I have grown up uh, hearing for a lifetime that if you don't stand for something, you will likely fall for anything. And so the question is, where, where and when do you pick to actually stand your ground? And what are the, the spiritual principles on which we should be standing? First, there is standing your ground in faith. Now, I know for our context and our conversation and our purposes, you think that would be a given, but unfortunately it is not. Let's pick up our reading in Acts 16 and verse 25 and 26. Around midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors immediately flew open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, where we left Paul and Silas and his companions off, they had been arrested, they had been beaten because he had rebuked uh, an evil spirit that possessed a young girl who made money for her own. She was a slave and she, she made money for her owners. Unprovoked and uninvited, Paul tried to ignore it as long as he could. He, he had it up to here and he finally rebuked the spirit and it left the girl. And because her owners lost that that revenue, that stream, that cash cow, they brought them in the public forum, accused them of violating the law, had them beaten and arrested, and, and thrown into prison. And then we pick up on the story. We, we don't know at what time that occurred during the day, uh, probably during the daylight hours. And so they had been in prison for some time. Their feet had been in chains. Uh, they were not going to go anywhere. Their, their backs were raw from having been beaten. And, and what do we find them doing? We find them standing in, in, in faith. Uh, it says that they weren't in there bemoaning uh, their situation or their circumstances or their pain or their wounds. They were praying. You can only guess what their prayers were. And singing hymns to God. It's interesting that word hymns is simply a Greek word that's been anglicized. Uh, hymnus. It simply means to sing praises. It's not a specific kind of, of spiritual song. It's just a spiritual song that acknowledges God's faithfulness. In all probability, this is a carryover from the days of Judaism when, when they sang psalms that gave credit and praise to God. Whatever the case were, they, they, they were singing because of their faith. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Uh, that simply serves as a footnote that we don't have answers to the questions that we may or may not come back to. Suddenly it says that there was an earthquake. While they're doing their thing, there's an earthquake. The foundations of prison are shaken so much so that the mortar lets loose, the stones lets go, lets, let loose, and the, and the prison doors, because of the violence, actually don't just unlock, but they actually open. And everyone's chains, uh, how you explain this from the earthquake, other than there was more than a physical earthquake, it was a spiritual earthquake because God had his purposes. They were released unfashioned from their chains. So in, in terms of standing your ground in faith, the question that has to be asked is, what, was it faith that, that got you into trouble? Because that, typically that's the framework that we want to, to, to put a story like this. 
believers in a situation and problems that, that God comes through on. But the question is, was it faith that got you in, into that problem? A, a, a line must be drawn between standing in faith under difficult circumstances that are the product of something other than faith. If you've done something stupid and gotten yourself into a problem situation, I, I'm not sure that standing in faith is going to deliver you by an earthquake, but that's between you and God. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's how most, God, most, most people treat faith and prayer and their confidence in God, whether they're a genuine follower of Jesus or not, if they think they are, it's sort of like um, I was in a conversation with my older brother this week, and and uh, and and we were talking about you know life, and 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 of course I'm talking about God's provision because He claims to be an atheist, so every, everything for Him is just simply a matter of of chance, a blind chance, and. Uh, uh, I, and I made the comment about using the expression that, that, that God was in it. And I don't remember exactly what our conversation was about. But this was his response. He says, you know, interestingly enough, people will find the use of that term under all circumstances. Whatever happens, if it turns out for the good, they'll say God's in it. And then I, I, I reported a story that was fresh for me in a conversation from my last hog hunt. Um, no hogs. Uh, on, on the ride, either coming and going, some of the, the men that, that, that I hunt with were talking about things that they had ordered online, you know, either hunting stuff or vehicle stuff. And whether it was Amazon.com or some other vendor, that they would receive the item once and then they would just receive a second item. And some of them were very pricey things. And you know what their comment was? It was a God thing. God was in it. Now, uh, this may surprise you, but I exercise remarkable constraints in not jumping down their throats and telling them how stupid that was. I just listened in amazement that they wanted to attribute a clerical error with the providence of God's goodness in their life, and they did not send back the second item. They found, you know, finders, keepers, receivers, keepers, uh, shippers, losers, weepers. So in terms of standing in faith, if, if the life circumstance we end up in is an unpleasant one, and it's because we have been walking in faith, then I think it's safe to say that we can expect God to do something. For Paul and his companions, they were in jail because of their faith. And what was their faith response? Their faith response was, in the moment, the first, and, and I think there's something to be said about the sequence of these positions of standing based on this story. That their first position of standing was standing in faith because they were confident in God. And so while they're locked up, they, they don't see any recourse. They don't know what's coming next legally for them. They don't know if they're going to be beaten again. Try it. They don't know any of those things. That instead they choose to pray and to sing. And the result of their standing in faith you, you read it, you heard it, that, that unexpected, unanticipated, it had never happened before for Paul. It would never happen again for Paul. But in that moment, they, they felt that. And if you've ever been one of these things, it is really, unless you live in California, I mean, it really is strange because if you're, you're unaccustomed to these things, the things you, you start to hear a rumble and you're wondering, what is that? And, and then you start seeing the effects of that around you, and, and you wonder what's going on, and it's not so much that there's a rumble and there's a shaking, and, and there's, there's pieces of mortar and stone falling around, and there's dust being created, but then your, your shackles fall off of your ankles, and you find yourself at a place of no longer being constrained or held back. The result of their standing in faith was divine intervention. I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to make this about me, but in, in, you know, in my lifetime of walking in faith and serving the Lord, I've seen the Lord come through more than just a few times in, in a seemingly miraculous way. And I think it's the direct result of, of finding myself in difficulty because of walking in faith and then when getting in that predicament to continue to walk in faith and let God come through. So the first place that we ought to be standing our ground is, is standing in faith. The second is standing your ground in character. In character, verse 27 and 28. 
When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Don't hurt yourself because we are all here. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're, left, you're left your imagination to, to reconstruct these events or this incident in your mind. But it would appear that while Paul and Silas were awake uh, it, to the midnight hour, they're praying and they're singing. The, the jailer is not so disposed to, to be doing something. He's gone to bed. He has gone to sleep. And in, in the midst of that, um, he is awakened. Now, I, you know, I, I've had this experience enough to, to be asleep at night and to have a sound wake me. And my first instinctive reaction is wake up and go, w w was that a real noise or was that in my dream? And so for a couple of moments, I'm trying to assess where I am and what's going on and what was the cause of that. And so apparently the, the, the jailer's residence is somewhere in close proximity to the jail. I'm, I'm led to believe by this account that it was not attached because there's nothing stated about the earthquake having the same effect on the jailer's residence as it had on the jail. The jail. So I'm thinking it, it, it was probably next door or across the street. It's somewhere in proximity because that was his life and that was his livelihood. And he is awakened in the middle of the night and he gets up and he looks out and he sees the remnants of what were once his jail. And he sees the front door or the front gate standing ajar. He's not seeing anyone around or hearing any sound. And he's drawing conclusions about what is taking place. Character uh, has been described as what we do when we don't think anyone is watching. <laughs> Were we to expand on that, it, would be, it, it might be what we would do when we think that we can get away with it. You see, standing our ground in character means living out the character of Jesus consistently, especially at the peril of life and liberty. So this jailer in the middle of the light, coming out of, of, of dead sleep, being awakened in this moment, to look out and to see what he sees. And, and his first conclusion is what? The prisoners have all escaped. No one to be seen in the dark of night. But the truth of the matter was that not only were Paul and his companions standing in faith, but they were also standing in character. They did not seize the moment, carpe diem, <laughs> seize the day, to slip out into the dark of night. N nothing would have been easier. And there's not a person on the planet, I think, that would have, would have blamed them for doing so. Listen, th they, they didn't have firearms in that day. The only weapons were swords and spears and such. Uh, there was no electronic devices. So if they slipped out in the dark of night and, and, and went their way, it is highly improbable that they would ever have been found, caught, and returned. And yet something in the character of Paul and Silas spiritually caused them to stand their ground and say, we're prisoners, we have, we have been arrested, we have been locked up, and the fact that the door is ajar does not give us the right to do in the night what we would not do during the daytime. They were walking in faith and in character. I, I, was, I was reminded as I was reading this and preparing this that um, some you, you probably won't know the name of J.C. Sullivan. J.C. Sullivan was a he was a criminal, uh, and he was a friend and an associate of, of Bonnie and Clyde back in the 30s, and so he was with them during some of their early exploits of of robbing banks, and um, and yet he ca he got caught early on, and imprisoned. You, you, we know the story about them. They continued until they were killed in the process of trying to evade the authorities. And it was while J.C. Sullivan was in prison that somebody introduced him to the gospel and he became a, a, a follower of Jesus. And he was so convicted because of this principle of, of standing in char character that he had never possessed before, that when he came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it altered not just his, his future, his eternity, his destiny, but it altered that quality about him that would be known as character. Whereas before his imprisonment, it, it didn't bother him to, 
to take a gun and to, to hold somebody up and to threaten their life. It didn't bother him to take their money, to run away, and feel like he'd gotten one over. After all, he was plying his trade as a, as a thief and as a bank robber. But something changed inside of him when he became a follower of Jesus. So much so that after he was released, after serving his time in prison, he spent the balance of his days going, trying to go back to all of the places that he had robbed and to offer to make restitution. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure many things uh, demonstrate character more than that. And I'm not sure how many of us have that kind of spiritual character. Standing your ground in character um, is a picture of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So here the scene is that in, in the middle of the night, um, the guard is awakened, he comes out, he, he thinks that the, the game is over, and yet the character of Paul and Silas, and for whatever reason, their influence on what the other, they weren't the only ones locked up. There were other people who had been listening to them, what, praying and singing. For whatever reason, not only did Paul and Silas not abandon the jail in the middle of the night, but the other prisoners did not either. Which brings us to the third place to stand, to stand our ground, and, and that's in faithfulness. In faithfulness, verse 29 and following. The jailer asked for torches and rushed inside. Trembling as he knelt in front of Paul and Silas, he took them outside and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you and your family will be saved. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and everyone in his home. At that hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized immediately. He brought Paul and Silas upstairs into his house and set food before them. He was thrilled, as was his household, to believe in God. Now, evidently, there's a lot of things about this account that, that, that we are only less to, to speculate on to guess. And that is that the guard that was responsible for their safekeeping may or may not have been aware of the charges that were against them. Now, I don't think that Philippi was a large place. And, and, and we know that smaller towns and smaller communities, very few things take place in the public arena that everybody eventually doesn't, doesn't hear about. But we, we can't assume that. So we, we don't know. All the guard knows is that they have been delivered to him by the authorities that he answers to. And his responsibility is not only to bind them and to keep them in the cell, but to make sure that they do not get away. Because under, under Roman law, and as a guard, he served under Roman law, that if, if the prisoners got away, his crime meant serving out their sentence. So he may not have been aware of what had taken place that had gotten them locked up. He was aware of what his responsibility. But when in the, in, in the dark of night, shrouded in a cloud of dust, and in the debris field where the jail had stood. He was prevented from suicide by those who normally would have escaped. When he looked out in the night, and, and, and it was almost probably like a fog, um, the result of the earthquake. And in his mind, he saw the doors open, nobody standing there. He assumes that they have all escaped. So he goes out, and we don't know who else is present, but it says he, he, he called for torches to go in to examine exactly the condition on the inside of the jail. And as he's peering through that dust, and, it, and in his mind he thinks they're all gone, I am not going to serve out their sentence. He drew his sword and was in a posture of position to kill himself. Now, he couldn't see Paul, but evidently Paul could see him. And Paul said, oh, 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 time out, time out, dude, stop. I'm not the only one that's still here. All of your prisoners are still here. 
the guard goes in, falls at the feet of Paul, and says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? I'm thinking in my mind, now we know he was asleep when the earthquake came. But I, I, I think that he probably went to sleep hearing his prisoners pray, verbally, out loud. Not trying to be obnoxious, not trying to be heard, but just speaking in normal tones. And in a time and a place where you don't have a lot of ambient noise from the culture, the dead of night, he could hear them praying. And he could hear them singing. And he perhaps in his mind had wondered, what kind of men are these? And what kind of faith is it that they have? And, and who is this Jesus that they're praying to and singing about? So in that moment, he asked the question that needed to be asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And, and they gave him the simple answer. If you want to know... How to, how to lead somebody into a faith relationship with Jesus. That's all they need to know. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now his faith and his confession weren't adequate for his household. But the truth of the matter was the scripture says that, that, that Paul got to share the gospel with the whole household. Because evidently they had all come out into the street. They had all come to the jail. They were all present for these events. And they all heard the same gospel invitation. And the scripture says, and the man believed, and his whole household became followers of Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, and immediately <laughs> Paul and Silas took, found a place to dunk them, to baptize them, to immerse them. He didn't spit on them. He didn't sprinkle them. It, apparently there was water convenient. In the middle of the night, everybody else was asleep. They took and baptized them. They went back. And the jailer says, come on to my house. And they took, him up, took them upstairs, washed their wounds, and put food before them. And it says, and they were thrilled that they had come to faith in God. For Paul and Sidus, faithfulness was their M.O. before the arrest. Faithfulness is where they also stood their ground, leading to the right question and the right answer. And the result was what? Salvation, baptism, and immediately acts of service by this new follower of Jesus. Number four place to stand your ground is to stand your ground in boldness. Verse 35. When day came, the magistrates sent guards who commanded, release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul and added, the magistrates have sent word to release you, so come out now and go in peace. But Paul told the guards, the magistrates have had us beaten publicly without a trial and have thrown us into jail even though we are Roman citizens. Now are, we going to, now are they going to throw us out secretly? Certainly not. Have them come and escort us out. The guards reported these words to the magistrates and they became afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So the magistrates came, apologized to them, and escorted them out. Then they asked them to leave the city. Leaving the jail, Paul and Silas went to Lydia's house. They saw the brothers, encouraged them, and then left. Standing your ground in boldness. Uh, it's a great account. After they had had their wounds tended, after they had been fed. Apparently Paul and his companions and, and the other prisoners who were there. Um, you know, had they, had they been a, a party to witness this confession of faith? Had they been a party to follow them down to a place of baptism? Had they too been invited back into the jailer's house and be fed? We, we, we do not know. Nothing is said of them. The fact that the jailer, apparently his life is not at risk um, in this moment, that they're still around. They all go back and, and they finish the night, whatever sleep that they can get. The next morning, the authorities send, send soldiers to go to the jail and, and to say, 
Release those prisoners. You know, their their public beating, their public humiliation, their being incarcerated overnight, that is sufficient for their crime. Just let them go, go about their business. Just don't do it again. And Paul said, ho, oh, oh. <laughs> ho, time, time out. We didn't do anything wrong, number one. Number two, they didn't even have a trial. Witnesses were not called. There was simply testimony before the magistrates who made an executive ruling, had us beaten, had us thrown in jail, and we're Roman citizens. You know what that means? We have certain rights. We have the right to face our accuser. We have rights to, to have evidence presented. We have the right to, to have a, a fair hearing. We receive none of those. No, 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 no. They were the ones that did this to us. They're going to have to come and we're going to have a parade leaving this place. So go back and tell them that we're not going to go with the guards. They are going to have to come and escort us out. Word was delivered back to the magistrates. Whew, they began sweating bullets. They did not know. And this was an interesting thing. Why Paul in that moment above, uh, in front of the magistrates before he had not invoked his, his rights as a, as a Roman citizen. You're left to figure that out. But we do know that now in this time he does that. When the word gets back, the magistrates are concerned because they don't answer to Paul. They answer to Rome. So it's not just the soldiers that come to the, the dilapidated jail, what is left of it. And, and I think there's something providential in this because they're going there. Now, apparently they don't know anything about an earthquake. They didn't experience an earthquake. They weren't awakened in the middle of the night. But to go there and to see their facility in shambles, to see evidence of the power of God, to see the fact that these prisoners had not escaped in the dark of night. It was a profound testimony of, of, of the standing in faith and the, and the standing in character and the standing in faithfulness and now standing in boldness. And it says they came and they apologized to Paul and Silas and escorted them out and ask them to please leave their community. I like the fact that it says that Paul, they went where? They, they said, okay, we're, we're good with that. They went to Lydia's house, where the first church had been born at the riverside. Uh, and they encouraged the brothers, which means evidently more than just Lydia and her household had become believers. And now you have a guard and a prison guard in his family. So you have a, you have a growing church in, in, uh, in Philippi. And he encourages the brothers, and then they left. You see, there's a, there's a fine line between arrogance and boldness. Uh, for, for Paul and Silas, this was the ground that they stood. They stood tall in their faith. They weren't ashamed. They weren't embarrassed. But I don't get the impression that the, this, this represented arrogance. It represented their fact that, that it was an opportunity to make a spiritual point in a place that needed a spiritual point. Um, you know, in, in thinking forward from here, you can well imagine that, um, that there was a lot of chatter in that town after those events. Paul and Silas, they moved on their missionary journey. But because of what God had done, he had birthed the church. There were several radical conversions that took place that I think that, that Philippi, and, and you read later on that when he writes his letters to the Philippians, uh, this is the people. He's, they had a special place in his heart. Because I think as a result of their boldness and they're requiring the authorities to come and do what they did, um, then it, it, it preached louder in the days and the months and the years to come than they possibly could have had had they slipped out silently and agreed to simply go their way. What does it mean to stand your ground in boldness? In January of 1517, Johann Tetzel was made the commissioner of indulgences um, in Rome. And, and that was that he was a part of a capital campaign to help pay for Saint, the building of St. Peter's Cathedral, which meant that he could go to all the surrounding towns and communities, and he could offer to have people's sins forgiven if they just gave enough money to the church. More so than having their sins forgiven, but th there was a limerick that, that when a, a coin in the coffer rings, then a soul from purgatory 
springs or something to that effect. And so he, that's what he's doing. He ended up in Germany where, where a young monk was, was teaching, well, was practicing his, his faith by the name of Martin Luther. Now Martin Luther, he, he was not just a scholar, but he was a man who was interested in really understanding what Scripture had to say. And he was beginning to have questions about some of the practices he had been taught a, a, as a part of, of the church. And so when Tetzel came to town selling these indulgences, then, then Luther took exception to that. And, and so he did what was normal protocol in that day was he, he drafted a list of concerns that he had about these practices. And he put them, he, there was a place of public notice because he wanted to have a conversation, whether you call it dispute or debate, he at least wanted to engage in conversation about these practices within the framework of what Scripture has to teach. And so he, he posted these 95 theses on, on the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, October the 31st in 1517. That was 1517. Now, I, I went back to read and try to figure out exactly when Luther came to faith, when he went from being a religious man to being a righteous man. Um, and, and I'm convinced by what I read that, that it was really a couple of years later before he had his conversion experience. The church didn't take kindly to the, the 95 Theses, and he was called in to give an account, and there, was, there were debates and disputes, and, and he was invited to, you know, for, forget this, relig this, this nonsense and go back to simply do his job. But, but Luther, he continued to study and teaching through the Psalms and reading in Romans and, and, in, and in Galatians. Uh, when he came across the passage, it says, and the, and the just shall live by faith, or the righteous shall live by faith. And, and where, where Paul talks about the righteousness of God, and, and it just g crawled all over Luther. He's trying to, to do everything he knows to do. After all, he's a monk. He's denied his, his, his life what it was, and he's doing these, these, these religious performances, and, and yet he reads that it never can be enough to achieve the righteousness of God. And it, in his response to that, that he realized that it was only in the righteousness of Christ in his atonement that he himself could be delivered from his sins and made righteous before God. And so he had a conversion experience a couple of years after posting these 95 theses on, on the, the, the chapel door in Wittenberg. Now that was an act of boldness. So Luther was, you know, he was invited to, to explain himself. He was a, a prolific writer and he continued to write things and the people at Rome continued to read those things and he was called in to give an account. And, and in January of, of 15 and 21, a couple of years after his conversion, uh, Pope Leo X, um, in, in his response to Luther's response of boldness, saying, I simply will not um, renounce the things that I've written because they're based on Scripture, he was excommunicated from the church. So immediately, there was what is known as the Diet of Worms. You and I would say the diet of worms is not what he had to eat. It was simply in, in the, the town of Worms where they, they, put, they, they uh, brought together an ecclesiastical council from January the 28th to May the 25th in our time frame in this coming week. Um, 500, 600 years ago is when Martin Luther was called. John, Johann Eck speaking on behalf of the empire as assistant of the Archbishop Bishop of, of Trier, presented Luther with copies of his writings laid out on a table and asked him if the books were his and whether he stood by their contents. Luther confirmed that he was their author but requested time to think about the answer to the second question. He prayed, consulted friends, and gave his response the next day. Quote, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures, I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. And at the end of his speech, Luther raised his arm in the traditional salute of a knight winning <laughs> about. Standing in boldness. Here was a man who stood in boldness, a Martin Luther. He'd come 
to know Jesus simply in his studying, his teaching, his preaching of Scripture. He's called by the church that employs him, that supervises him, that has authority over him. And when given a chance to renounce those truths that he's come to embrace because of his walk with Christ, he essentially said, I stand on the word of God. This is where I stand. I can do no other. That's what it means to stand in boldness, knowing that they could pass a sentence not just of excommunication against him, but a sentence of death. Uh, he was slipped out uh, of Worms, went back to his place, and the, and the governing authorities there in Germany protected him for the rest of his life, even though he was under the sentence of death. Uh, wh where where to, to stand your ground, I'm, I'm convinced that if, if we want to be salt and light, uh, it, it can be as, as a church, um, or it can be as an individual. If we won't make a lasting impression on people that need Jesus in our community, among our friends, among our relatives, then the, the place that we stand on a regular basis and the place that we stand under difficult circumstances, in all probability, may create the opportunity to answer the question that eventually gets asked, and that is, what must I do to be saved? My challenge to you is don't wait until you're in a jail to start doing those things. Accept the call and the claim of Christ on your life, whether individually or as a church, to say, this is what Scripture teaches. I'm going to be this person regardless of what anybody else says or does in my life, regardless of what it may cost me or the people in my lives, because I'm committed to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to reflect His character, and to be that person that has credibility when the time comes to answer the question, what must I do to be saved? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share these words, to work through this process of understanding this account, perhaps in a new and a fresh way. Thank you for your, your claim uh, on, on the lives of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. And Father, for those who may venture onto this that uh, aren't believers, that, that you would use this to encourage them to not find rest until they've hands ed answers to that question. Father, help us to be a Paul and a Silas under all circumstances. As we live, as we go, as we work, as we play, as we, as we worship. So that regardless of the circumstances, we can, we can be said, not by our own admission, but by the admission of witnesses that we have stood in faith, we've stood in character, we've stood in our ground in faithfulness, and we've stood our ground in boldness. Now, Father, bless these because of their time and their generosity. Use them as instruments of your peace where you have planted them. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you once more for your, your time indulging me this opportunity to share this journey. It, it truly is a lifeline for me until God opens the door of opportunity going forward. Continue to pray for us on our ministry. And if you let me know of your prayer concerns, that I, I will pray for you and I'll even let others know. Let, let us hear from you. Let me hear from you. You know, send me an email at this email address or send me a, a message on Facebook Messenger. Knowing that if, if you have people that don't do Facebook, and there's a lot of those, and, and they would like to participate, you can find us on, on YouTube as well or on Vimeo. And simply contact me and I'll provide you with that link. And then invite others. This, let's make this a spiritually organic process where th those who, who, who log on and who find us and who share this journey are those who have been invited to do so because you appreciate what we do and you're being affected by that. For those who want to support our ministry, th there should be on Facebook a place that you can make a donation. If you want to know other ways to do that, if you want to simply send a check old school style like many others are doing, then you can send it. Uh, make the check payable to Church Rebirth Ministries, Inc., and to this mailing address. Once again, thank you for the privilege of spending this time with you. God bless you, and we look forward to doing this again next week.